This is Texans TV. We find out more about Terrence Mitchell. You know, without football, I don't know what I'd do. And we enter the deep slant. Sack back at the 10-yard line as John Grenard gets him. Texans 360 starts now. We are ready to rock. In his rock and roll. Hey, greatness today, man. And touchdown, Texans. I got fleets for all y'all. That's when you think you've seen it all. There's always something else. Where would you rather be right now, man? Welcome into Texans 360. We've got another great show for you planned tonight. Hi, I'm GP Sidhu, and it's October, and it's a crazy busy month. There's a lot of really important initiatives going on that we're going to get to in tonight's show. Chris Moore and his wife doing some great things in the community for a cause very near and dear to their heart. And Terrence Mitchell, he's doing some good things on the field, but we get to know him a little bit better. But first, it was the crucial catch game against the New England Patriots. Elizabeth Weiss was the Texans' home field advantage captain. Check out more behind her story and why the Texans selected her. I'm actually a native Houstonian. I have three brothers, so big fans here uh, in Houston with all Houston sports teams, but you know, particularly the Texans. I've been very fortunate to be able to attend games over the years, and it's been fun to sort of watch their successes. So I actually have a very strong family history of breast cancer. So at 37, I actually got my first mammogram. And then last year, um, around April or May, I started to notice an abnormality um, on the left breast. And so I immediately sort of went into the doctor. I had several mammograms and then that leads to a biopsy. And so actually a month and a day after my 40th birthday, they called and said that it was um, positive um, for cancer. Being diagnosed around the time of COVID was you know, very unfortunate because you went to everything um, by yourself due to the medical protocols. You get dropped off um, you know, outside and you wave to your family and friends. It was certainly very difficult. It's also very overwhelming. I had a big support system, so it was helpful to have friends and family who were you know, positive and around keeping that strong community of people around you to keep your spirits up and to remain positive. I've known Elizabeth for more than a decade and as a friend community we had a group that would bring her to treatment from treatment got together whenever we could phone calls at all hours of the day and night just to let her know she's not in it alone as difficult as that journey was personally and physically for her but mentally during the covid world made it much harder for her and others there's a lot of very sad moments in your cancer treatment. The first thing I thought was, well, I'm not surprised when they called and gave me the, the diagnosis. And then I thought, I really just don't want to lose my hair. There's a lot of moments where it's falling out and you just think, I don't look good and I don't feel good. And will it ever come back? And will you go for normal again? Someone as young as, as she is, um, when she was diagnosed, she went through all the fears. I think that's natural. Elizabeth has an unbelievable head of hair. And that was something that she was very proud of. So I actually did all of my chemo treatments with a cold cap. So it's a, a freezing cold cap that you wear during the chemo treatments to help protect your hair follicles. So it actually adds on additional time to your treatment. So um, I was getting two different kinds of chemotherapy. Um, both were about an hour drip. So um, they were very long days. You're plugged in with your IVs, um, machines everywhere. My last chemo treatment was actually the week of Thanksgiving, so I was very thankful <laughs> for it um, sort of all to be over, at least that portion of sort of the treatment. You know, crossing that milestone of, of finishing chemo, you know, was obviously something to celebrate, and then you start to get back into your regular routine and returning to work, and you're feeling better and starting to look, you know, more yourself. Congratulations, Elizabeth. It's a big thing for cancer patients once their treatment journey ends is to ring that bell that we see people do, signifying my treatment journey's in, now let's go on with living life as a survivor. She couldn't do that during the COVID world. So the American Cancer Society has had a long-standing relationship with the National Football League and particularly with the Houston Texans. Every year during our crucial catch game, the Texans want to bring survivors out and honor them for their warriorship, for their journey, for the battles that they've done. And so the idea came, do you know anybody like that? And she was the one. 
He said they're looking for a special opportunity to be able to come and, and ring the bell, knowing that so many people last year, due to COVID, went through treatment on their own, but then also were able to sort of celebrate with their friends and family. So I think I started immediately crying. <laughs> And then just was very excited and very honored to be asked to do that. And, you know, obviously being a Texans fan for so long, um, it was very exciting to be able to be honored in that way. Is there anything that you said to yourself before you ran out into the tunnel? I said, go aggressively ring that bell. <laughs> they, they, they said, ring the bell aggressively. And I thought, you know, this is a moment you get to celebrate and ring the bell loudly and, and smile. Please welcome today's home field advantage captain, proud breast cancer survivor, Elizabeth Weiss. It's very overwhelming being able to sort of walk out there and again celebrate where you are today and, and the happiness that that brings was very exciting. The cool part for myself and our other friend that was there is when she came off the field, she didn't walk off the field, she ran off the field, huge smile on her face and grabbed us both and wouldn't let go. Um, that symbolizes the thanks to that whole friend community and like, you know, I'm gonna be okay. I don't think you can ever fully describe the emotion and the, the gratefulness and, and the thankfulness that you feel. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's actually really hard to put into words, but I guess the best thing you can say is thank you um, and, and try to reciprocate when they're having those their moments too and just being there for your friends and family. That moment when Elizabeth rang the bell, I mean, I had chills. It was, it was one of those moments that's just bigger than football. So Texans, they're home again this week. They've got the LA Rams. I caught up with my friend Serena Morales to find out more about this six and one Rams team. Do they have any weaknesses? We ask her everything. It's time for NA Sidelines presented by Microsoft. My guest this week, Serena Morales. She was the Rams team reporter. She now works with Valley Sports. Serena, always good to have you on and uh, how about these Rams? I mean, how would you gauge the excitement level in Los Angeles from now compared to some of the years where Jared Goff was there? It gives you like the, the when they went to the Super Bowl vibes a little bit, there's like this rejuvenation of hope. Obviously the last season with Jared Goff, uh, just last season, that game where they lost to the Jets was such a like, all the air was sort of like let out of the room, like, oh gosh, it's done. They're not going anywhere with this quarterback. And so when you see Matthew Stafford and what he's done and just the crazy connections he's made with Cooper Cup so far, I think it's been cool to see like come to fruition. And LA, I mean, I, they're packed. SoFi Stadium is packed every freaking Sunday when they're at home. All right, let's talk about Matthew Stafford because he just passed 300 career touchdowns and three touchdowns in Sunday's game against the Lions. I know the expectations were pretty high for him, but what's been the biggest surprise about him so far this season? I watched film with uh, Sean McVay and a few uh, beat writers this off season. McVay wanted to show all of the writers like, hey, this is why I get so excited about Matthew Stafford. His calmness in the pocket, his ability to move when he is about to get sacked is beyond impressive to the human eye. If you watch things in slow motion and he goes through all of his reads and then he goes back and makes the best decision, which is why you've seen more Tyler Higby uh, receptions this season. It's why you're seeing like that balance of Van Jefferson who's popped this season. Uh, Robert Woods is certainly making a splash when he can. And you're seeing other targets besides Cooper Cup. Now, obviously he's Matthew Stafford's favorite target, but I think you're getting a lot of different mixes. It depends on the play. But yeah, I think his ability to be just calm under center and his ability to make really smart throws and protect the football, something I think we saw Jared Goff not do so well in seasons prior. Serena, always a pleasure uh, catching up with you. Um, have a great game day and we'll talk soon. Thank you. You too. Coming up, Terrence Mitchell talks about his football story. That's coming up next on Texans 360. Welcome back to the Ford Studio. We roll on with Texans 360. Terrence Mitchell, 
He's in year one with the Texans. He's in year eight with the NFL. It's been a long and winding road, and here he is. Three forced fumbles, tied for second in the NFL. But where did he come from? We find out in his My Football Story. I'm from Sacramento, California. I started liking football the moment I started playing it at seven. I started off with flag football first, but you know, it was still football. I just wanted to be good. My first position, <laughs> I was a DN. They had me at DN, the littlest dude on the team at DN, but I had to work my way up and earn some stripes. And I became a running back in a corner. Growing up in the inner city, you had to be tough, you know, playing for the Southside Vikings. I think that's where I get a little bit of my edge from. I went to Luther Burbank High School in Sacramento. We didn't have too many Friday night games due to problems in the area sometimes, so we played Saturday mornings. High school ball was fun, going out winning games, you know, playing with some of my childhood friends I played Pop Warner with. It was just an overall good experience. Some of the funnest times of my life playing football, really. Coming out of high school, my options for college were very minimal. I was a three-star recruit, but I had a few offers like Washington State, UNLV, Cal Poly, but I went to this camp and uh, balled out and Oregon offered me. I didn't need to look no further. Terrence Mitchell, watch out, could be, it is the one. Touchdown, Oregon. Oregon was real fun, you know, all the Nike uniforms, he being able to swag out every game, new pair of cliques, then top-notch facilities. It was everything a, a young athlete could ask for. Coming out of Oregon, you know, I left school early my junior year. That year I had about five picks, played in a lot of big games at Oregon, started since a freshman, so I was like, I think I'm ready for the NFL. I wind up getting drafted in the seventh round to the Dallas Cowboys. I was with the Cowboys for a training camp. I got cut. After the Cowboys, I went to Chicago, and then from Chicago, I went back to Dallas, then to Houston, and then found a home in Kansas City, and that's where the beginning started. Went from Kansas City for a couple years and played three years in Cleveland, and now I'm back in Houston. Being cut early on in my career, that many times, you know, it could make or break a person, but I always knew and felt I had the ability, and sometimes you gotta just stay down till you come up. I just kept working. I had a great support system with my family. We just kept working hard and finally got an opportunity and made the most of it, and eight years later, I'm here. What a play to turn away New England. Terrence Mitchell got in there to force it. The game of football means a lot to me. You know, it has allowed me to provide for my family, provide for myself, provide for my daughter. You know, without football, I don't know what I'd do. It just definitely opened up the doors for me to be able to live out my dreams and childhood wishes. Team Money Mitch showing out on the field. Another guy showing out in the field, John Grenard, six sacks so far through seven games. He leads the Texans, doing great things in year two. I had a chance to catch up with him in this week's Deep Slant. It's a Deep Slant presented by Xfinity. My guest this week, Jonathan Grenard, bright spot as head coach David Culley describes him. How has it been for you in year two, just healthy, getting back on the field, getting some plays out there? It's fun. I think just with a new feel of everything, you know, with new coaching staff, uh, new players as well, I think overall we just kind of have that that new feel, and I think we're all hungry. I think we all got kind of got a clean slate here, and I think just all of us gelling together and all having that same mindset of, you know, some guys are on one-year deals and stuff like that. They're just trying to put their best foot forward, and I think when you have that all in the room in general, not just on the defensive side, but on the other side as well in all aspects, it helps everybody just to one thing you don't have to worry about is effort, and I think that one thing keeps driving us to make the plays and stuff like that. All right, speaking of effort, you've had multi-sack back-to-back games. So right. two sacks and back-to-back games. It seems like you're really getting to the quarterback. Is something different for you this year? What's What's been your secret to really getting after it after these quarterbacks? Yeah, I think uh, last year just getting my feet wet a little bit, understanding how the game goes uh, helped me out a lot in those aspects just to get a feel for it. Um, but definitely just to continue just to keep playing. Like I said, with this with this new staff, new system, and the new scheme we run, it just lets people play. It lets the guys just go, you know, get in your gap, give you assignment, not to think that much and just go make plays. So I think once the thinking aspect was taken out of it, uh, especially coming from last year with a different defense, um, I was just able to go, and I think that's what we're seeing now, just me just continue to be relentless in effort uh, just so that way I can try to make the most plays for the team. 
Uh, Levy Smith said, you know, we think the sack numbers are really high for you, but Levy Smith said that you still left some sacks on the field. Yeah, yeah. Do you <laughs> feel that in game? Do you feel like that was a missed opportunity, or is that something that you go back and you watch the film and you see it? It's a little bit of both, but majority of times I, I see it or I feel it. Like, as soon as I the play happens, I come to the sideline like, oh, I should have had that one. Like, I just know that, you know, in the Coast game, I got tripped up. I know I should have had that one. Or it's a, a holding call. You just see that, you know, whether you clear this hand or that's that goes back to your training, you know, uh, clean, clearing those hands so that way they can't hold you so that way you don't not get the sacks. All those little small details that you have to hone in on. And I, as D lineman or anybody knows, you, you we miss the play because of a technique thing, you know it instantly. All right, so Lovey says that you're still coming into your own. He says that you still have your best football ahead of you. What are your thoughts on that, and, and how do you think you're going to get better here throughout the rest of the year? Yeah, I, I think the same thing. This game is about trying to be perfect, trying to find the next step to enhance your game to where you're beating your opponent uh, at, at the snap of a finger. All right, looking forward to seeing it, John. Always a pleasure. We'll talk soon. Thank you so much for having me. Chris Moore and his wife spread awareness about a special cause. That's coming up next on Texans 360. Texans 360 rolls on, and we've got a lot of players with a lot of very special causes that are near and dear to their heart, like wide receiver Chris Moore and his wife, Taraya. It is October, which means it's Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. He wanted to spread awareness with his wife because this is a cause very close to their hearts. Last July, we experienced a stillbirth with our firstborn son, CJ. And before experiencing that, all we knew October was Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and it wasn't until we experienced that and had talked to other families who had also experienced it that it's also Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. So it really hits home for us, especially because it was so recent. We didn't expect it or know that this was a thing that happens, and we kind of felt alone when it first happened. So we just want to let other people know that they're not the only ones that have gone through something like this. It's easy to feel isolated and kind of keep to yourself. And we had a really good support system at the time. Our football family, I would say, really came through for us. Some days we just wanted to be normal and we had a lot of like themed dinner nights with our friends at the time and our faith is truly what helped us. I don't know how we would get through it without trusting that God's plan is always better than our own. As a parent, you'll never be able to forget, but just always letting people know that he was there and that he was junior, he was supposed to be the second me, so, I mean, just honoring him every day, just trying to be the greatest parents we can. 2% of pregnancies end in a stillbirth, so there's not many people, and I remember thinking, just Googling, like seeing if there were other people who had experienced it, looking on YouTube, seeing if anyone was like talking about it, and there honestly weren't that many resources, and I think that just speaking up and being a voice for people so that they do know, like you said, that you're not alone. Got a little Nyla here. She's three months old and uh, she's the biggest blessing in our life. She came along quickly after we lost CJ. When people ask, is this your first? I like to say, no, she's not our first. We have two, one in heaven, one here. As a father, she's at the point now where she can recognize me and smiles. And that is like the greatest thing ever. And children are so precious and I think we want a few more. <laughs> Yeah, we definitely want to keep growing our family. Um, Lord willing, we'll have some more children. Uh, but yeah, we're just super thankful to have her here and we don't take any day for granted that we have with her for sure. When we lost CJ, they take pictures of your baby for you and you want something nice that they're in because that's, that's all you're going to have to remember them for the rest of your life. So we just like to give them some nice onesies so that when, if that ever happens to people that they can have something nice that their children are in or, or any, even parents that are just in the NICU that they have nice onesies besides the plain white ones. So it, it was awesome experience and uh, I hope we definitely help some people by doing that. I'll put this right here. Thank you. I, of course. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. So if anybody else is going through this experience, if you have a significant other, just really reach out to them and lean into them because honestly, that and our faith it was the two things that really got us through this. And we just really want to kind of keep his legacy alive by bringing awareness to it and just being kind of a voice for people who have also experienced the loss. Out in the community fighting hunger. That's next on Texans 360. A portion of this broadcast is sponsored by Cigna. 
together all the way. We're back with more Texans 360, and the Texans are always out and about in the community with an initiative called Huddle Against Hunger, where they team up with the Houston Food Bank to fight hunger in the Houston community. This week was no different. We had some players out and about as they surprised a teacher this week. What was great about today is we were able to educate the fourth and fifth graders and, and, and cer certainly thank the teachers for all they do for these uh, students. We educated them, we played some games around nutrition, uh, asked a lot of questions. I, you know, and then most importantly to thank our teachers, right, for participating. We were able to uh, reward one of our teachers with uh, groceries for an entire year. It's the first school to be 100% participation and we're excited to be here and talk to the kids about the program. I think most importantly is uh, not only to understand food insecurity and the number of folks that are struggling to get food every day, but also for those that are fortunate enough to have enough food to understand those who don't. I love kids. They inspire and they, you know, so amazed to, you know, just be in your presence. So, you know, come around fourth or fifth graders. I wouldn't say no to this in a million years, so it's a blessing. You know, I was one of those kids who, uh, who starved, you know, and, you know, didn't have anything to eat. and. And I'm blessed to be able to, to share, you know, a little fun with the kids today. Love seeing our players out and about the community. Love seeing you every single week. We'll be back here, same time, same place, next week. That's going to do it for Texans 360. Special thanks to Tyler Sutter, who works so hard on this show, and all of you out there. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, go Texans. Thanks for watching and go Texans. Like, subscribe, and ring the bell for new content.